Let's turn now in our Bibles to James, James chapter 1. We've been working our way steadily through, and tonight we come to verses 9 through 12. If you are reading a Bible that uses paragraphs, you, verse 12 perhaps may be in the next section. You have to ask yourself, who made that section? Did God give to those apostles those paragraph delineations, or is that the work of the editors? It is the work of the editors. You know from the ancient letters, they just wrote in one continuous line, not to waste any space on those precious pieces of paper. And so they just wrote. They didn't even put spaces between words, much like my young children do. <laughs> and so really, there's much debate about what belongs where. I will make a case tonight that 12 belongs in verses to 9 through 11. Before we read the text, let's ask the Lord to bless the reading and the preaching of His Word. Let's pray together. Lord, as was requested, we ask again, wondrously show your loving kindness, O Lord, to those who take refuge in your right hand, against those who rise up against them. Lord, keep them indeed as the apple of your eye. And may they find shelter this evening underneath your everlasting wings. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. We didn't stand this morning. We will stand this evening for the reading of God's Word. Let's stand together. James 1, beginning verse 9, this is the Word of God, where truth resides. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. Because, like flowering grass, he will pass away. The sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and the flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man, in the midst of his pursuits, will fade away. Blessed is a man, or the man, who preserves under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord, He, has promised to those who love Him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God endures forever. Please be seated. Our title tonight is Let Him Boast. I remember from my early years always having this just being repulsed by the idea of boasting. Perhaps it's how my parents raised me. Maybe some of my teachers. I actually was a public school uh, product, believe it or not. South Florida. I only wrote one paper <laughs> by the time I graduated high school. But I was instilled with this thought that one should never ever toot their own horn. One should never boast and speak of themselves as being great, mighty, and wonderful. It's just it's not right. Whenever someone started to boast, I tuned out. And that helped me as a young man. Helped me turn, tune out a lot of rap music. <laughs> Have you noticed that? I'm talking about the secular rap music. It, it really is about a couple things, just like country music is about a couple things. Rap music is usually about the money I made, right? The cars I drive and all these people and all the friends that like me. All the things that don't satisfy your soul, like Merle was talking to us this morning. I, I, I heard all that boasting and I was just tuned out. didn't like to hear it. I, I also struggled with the sport that I loved. I loved to throw a round ball into a circular red hoop about 10 feet off the air. It's called basketball. I love that sport. I love playing that sport. It was something that just attracted me. I, I was somewhat good, affirmed, and I was just kept on going. And, you know, when you got out of rec league, you went into middle school and high school, and that's where all the, you know, the, some of the competition becomes more stiff, and 
you get some good players. Um, some claims to fame I actually played against, and it was seriously beaten down hard by a, a future NBA player. And uh, I'm not boasting, I'm saying how poorly. I, I, I shut him down to 18 points, which is great. If you score 18 points, that's, a, that's wonderful. So I didn't shut him down at all. But I, I remember just constantly hearing on the court, because there's no, no helmets that separates you. No, you're really just all together there. And you're really up close guarding your man. I remember constantly hearing what they call jawing. It's, it's really boasting. In which they're just talking about, did you see what I just did to you? See how I just made you trip up? And I just, I just scored over you, that three-pointer. Did you see that? And, and, and the idea was, was to get inside the head of your opponent and break them down. I just, I hated it. I didn't want to participate. I knew I just, you know, inside my flesh was just wanting to just say something. But I was a principled young man. <laughs> and I didn't participate. I just wanted my play to say how good I was. Well, maybe that was because I really wasn't that good. Um, maybe that's why I struggled with boasting. But I was just, I was convinced that boasting was always and forever wrong. And then something happened. Not in high school, much later actually, really about five years ago when I went to General Assembly, the PCA, and I heard a sermon by a very, very famous preacher. I can tell you later who it is, but that's not of importance right now. It's more important that he turned to 1 Corinthians and showed me from 1 Corinthians that boasting in the sermon is a biblical concept. It's a right concept as well. And he, he, he said it's like this as he was explaining his text. He was, he was saying that originally boasting had its roots in military warfare. And the thought was, how are you going to get a bunch of farmers or even soldiers who are tired, how do you get them to rally the courage and to face the enemy? How do you do that? could pay them, but not everyone had a lot of money. You could threaten them, but that just instilled more fear. What a common practice was, was to boast. Was to talk to the troops about how sharp their swords were. How trained they were. And how unfit the enemy was. And how they have the ability to just, just wipe the floor with them destroy them, or even more, more barbaric, chop off their heads, right, and put them on a pike. That's the thought, right? And that would just elicit courage from the people. Say, yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. They picture what's, how it's going to all happen, and they say, yes, let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, you just have everyone become the cheerleader, and they're running into battle, and they're ready to defeat their enemy. They're glorying, boasting in what they're about to do. That's the concept. Well, that concept isn't from the world, actually. It's actually used in the Old Testament Scriptures. But tonight, we're just going to turn to our Scripture and see how it is used. It, that's the word that is used in verse 9. It's not just to glory. That's another way you could say it. It's really to boast. And what James is asking of the Christian, he's asking for the Christian to boast. But the humble brother, or the brother of humble circumstances, is to boast in his high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. He wants the Christian to boast. This is a very biblical concept. And there's a reason why. Because just like in times of warfare and getting the troops to face the enemy, as James has been talking about since verse 2, there are various trials that we must face. That we must endure. Be it a consolidated enemy and mass, yes. Be it a very liberal force that seeks to root out the church. Be it a very pugnacious person at your work that hates God. Or perhaps it's just various trials of infertility 
of singleness, of depression, of what you name it. It could be anything. What James is saying, I, got, I have another tool for your tool belt in how you're going to face these tribulations and trials. I want you to boast. And there's something that he puts in verse 12. Because in verse 12, and here's my argument for why 12 belongs with the previous section, actually all the way from 2 to 12, is that James uses the same words. He uses the words, blessed is the man who perseveres. That word persevere is the same word in verse 4 and verse 3. It's endurance or patience or perseverance. It's all the same word. Why it's translated differently, I do not know. But then also the word trial, that's the same word that is used earlier. Verse 2, various trials that you face. James is giving to us more help. And the help he wants us to see, the boast that he wants us to have, is that one day we're going to receive the crown of life from him who promised it to us. He wants us to think of that day. Not of our strength or our ability and what we can do. He, he's thinking about one day all the saints of God being presented this victor's crown. That's the crown here. It's a wreath that is placed upon the head for the one who perseveres or endures. Everyone. Everyone who endures till the end shall be saved and on that day shall receive that, that victor's crown of life. Hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little. And now here is so much more. We all long to hear it. We all look forward to that day. And, and in that, James wants you to put that as your boast. And say, regardless of what's going on here, as we just fight it out down below, one day above, we will receive the crown of victory. To boast. That's the thought in, that is contained within these verses. James wants us to boast in what Christ has for us. That's the point of this passage. But to explain verses 9 and 11, you say, well, how do these fit? Well, 9 and 11 essentially become examples. Some of the struggling, the various trials that we face, not just singleness and infertility, depression, liberalness on, on the whole, whatever it may be. It's more so, he says, the old Christian in ancient times, he faced two trials at least. And that's why he, he relates it to all of them. Humble circumstances and riches. Now, what I want to do the, with the rest of our time is I just want to show you that from the text. I want to show you how we are to boast through our poverty, but also to boast through our riches. Those are two points, okay? So we're going to work through that. First, number one, verse nine, let the poor man boast. Let the poor man boast. Literally, verse nine says this. This is just straight from the Greek. Let him boast, the brother the lowly one in his exaltation or uplifting. Let him boast the brother, the lowly one, his, in his exaltation or lifting up. And, and really, this I'm glad this comes first because this is the easier example. It's easy to see how poverty is a trial. And it's easy to understand also how we are to boast. And just to think of the trial. <laughs> we all think that poverty is a trial, right? How many of us pray, Lord, take all my money away. <laughs> my 401k, just give it away, oh God. The money I have saved up for my kids. Other well, money you're trying to save up for your kids, right? Just, just give it away. I, I, I want to be rich. No, we don't pray that way. We, we, excuse me, poor. We don't pray that way. Why? Because it's obviously a struggle. 
Perhaps from a, a, a young age, you knew what it was like to go from, from hand to mouth. You knew how hard it was just to wait on the next job so you could eat and provide for your family. And so you vowed to yourself that you would never want anyone to go through this, and nor especially your family go through this again, so you're going to work hard so you wouldn't be poor. It's clear that poverty is a trial. And James here is he's using a word that means to, to be put low. It's, the, it's an opposite. The later word, exaltation, means high, and here it means low, to be put low. And it, throughout the New Testament, it is always used figuratively, either materially, it's not just being put low as in bowing, but it's being put low financially or ethically. You've done something wrong. And yet, uh, Luke 1.52 provides us the right comparison here, that James is in, in fact considering finances, as he puts in 152 between the difference between rulers, those who have everything, and those who are poor and have nothing. James is thinking about the brothers in the church and the sisters in the church that do not have finances. And this, again, like you said, is a very clear example of struggle, of a trial. But also what is clear as well is that Though the the brother is in humble circumstances, we know what he means to say he is the glory in his high position. Is that he he there's no he doesn't have a high position. So what physically, financially, he doesn't have any high position. How possibly can he have in the in anyone's eyes a high position? Well, this is where it goes back to James two through seven is that he is to consider all joy when he endures various trials, knowing that the testing of his faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Is that in that poverty, in that trial, he is being given the opportunity to gain endurance, which will sanctify him. That's the high position is that though the world looks down on him, God has really lifted that one up so that that one can grow in their poverty. We don't think that way, do we? New Testament talks about, the the apostles talk about, Jesus says it's harder for harder for a, a camel to go through the eye of, the need, of a needle, right? Then uh, it's easier for it, the, the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to go into heaven. And they're like, what? I thought rich men all go to heaven. <laughs> no, but really the exalted state is of the poor man. And see, the, what James wants the poor man to do is to boast, not that he is poor, but how God is working through his poverty to increase his endurance so that he might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, and receive that crown of glory from Jesus Christ. He says, think on that. And really, that is no joke at all. You know, many of, you know, there's an old American spiritual, do Lord, oh do Lord, remember me. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Who's saying that spiritual? Those who had very, very little. And what were they doing when they sang that? They weren't just lifting up their souls. They were boasting in what they have is that though they have nothing on this earth, that God has given them a mansion in the heavens. And see, here, there's the same thought. Despite the great poverty, God is bringing about endurance in my life, and I'm going to receive the crown of glory one day. Glory. Glory. You know, there's a story of, a, uh, of an old Cornish preacher. Cornish, that's the the part in, uh, to your perspective, the southernmost tip of the UK or England. It's the little jettison out into the sea there. Uh, It was a 19th century preacher known as Billy Bray. 
Billy Bray was known for some pretty unorthodox preaching. He would, in the middle of his sermons, sometimes just be caught up so much in the thought, he not only pulled out a tissue and started crying, like some of us do, but he started dancing. He started dancing just shouting glory. What, but there's a story told about how a, a, a congregant went to speak to his mother and it related to her a precious thought. And his mother, to speak of where he got it from, heard this precious spiritual truth and she just started gl saying glory, <laughs> glory and dancing. And that story was related back to him and he said that and guess what Billy did hearing that about his mom? He did the same thing, glory. Just started dancing, and, and he said this. I'm summarizing, paraphrasing. He said, if David can dance, so can I. Because I'm a king of a son. I'm the, I'm the son of a king. I'm the king's son. And that so, in, so encapsulated his life that, he, that the biographer hid the title to the book from F.W. Bourne's biography on Billy Bray, is a king's son. And see, Billy Bray had nothing. He was the son of a miner. And we, he converted and he started preaching to the miners. He had even less. <laughs> but when he gained money, you know what he did? He started building churches. And people were like, you don't have any money. His wife was actually even concerned. You're giving away too much money, Billy. And Billy's thought was he was just captivated by it doesn't matter. Why? Because he knew what really mattered. His spiritual state in being ready to meet the king. Are we ready to meet the king? Are we willing to endure that time of poverty? Young people, as you have your ambitions, or perhaps those who are thinking about your next career, do not make money your greatest treasure. Because you cannot serve both God and money. And as you serve Him, He may call you through a season of poverty. Do you know in the UK, they intentionally don't pay their pastors a lot of money? for the reason that they don't want them to struggle with money. <laughs> they think it's better that they're poor than they become rich. Don't like that idea, that infliction. I like the PCA's difference in that to provide for the minister's care and their family. But you know, there's something to that. Something to that. You know, we can boast Boast in what God is doing despite our great poverty. Let the rich, excuse me, let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his high position. What this looks like is, it looks like not dwelling on the lack of money. Not just talking to God about it. That's who you're going to talk to him about. To, to, to be one who is working, yes, always work. I will not tell you an example of one who does not work. That's not right. You must be busy. God has given you hands and feet and six days to work. And we are to do that. What I'm more so saying is understand that as you work and the money doesn't start flowing in, understand that maybe God has something else that He's trying to work on in your life. And when you realize that, say, glory, glory, let him boast, he who is poor. But then secondly, the more difficult one, the rich man, verse, verse 10, is to glory or boast in his humiliation. This is the more difficult one and appropriately receives more attention from James. What's difficult about this is that the trial is not clear. We often think of riches as a blessing, and we pray for those riches. Yet, there is a problem, and there is a way to see 
riches as a curse. Remember Fiddler on the Roof? Money is a curse. The other difficulty is to see exactly what is in view with this humiliation. Uh, Some have uh, speculated that the humiliation is that his money is taken away from him. I, I, I have difficulty with that. The difficulty with that is because there's a perfect parallel and there's a reliance upon the verb of verse 9 to put in verse 10. The the brother of her humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. And there's a flip-flop. The rich man is to glory in his humiliation or his putting low. The one who has much is to exalt in his humiliation. There's a verb that's required to supply to fill out the rest of verse 10. And it's the one from above, to boast or to glory. And the clue to the interpretation of humiliation is found in how we interpreted verse 9. What's the high position of the poor man? The spiritual blessing. The spiritual blessing. The high state of him spiritually. So then, if we are going to make this work, the parallelism here, the humiliation has to be spiritual. Not the taking away of his money. Not the giving away of his money. But somehow, in the midst of riches... There really is a humiliation that happens spiritually. And you're not to say that humiliation isn't good. No, there's, there's, there's good here. He's not saying that, you know, the exaltation is a good thing and the humiliation is the bad thing. No, they're both good because they're both spiritual blessings. But how, how does it all work out? How is riches a curse or a trial? Well, that's the point of the rest of verse 10 and 11. Read with me. Because the flowering grass, like the flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with the scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. See, you see, here's the curse of the trial of riches, is that you think your riches really matter. And you give all your attention to it. It's all about another day and another dollar. And you're constantly serving this master of the green stuff, this mammon, this idol. And you're constantly putting everything in. And yet, as the humiliation of it all is that it's all going to pass away. Is that we're all, despite our positions and status in this world, there's only one position before the cross of Christ that is on our knees, all the same before Him. So too in eternity as well, there's all this equal status. It's all going to pass away. It's going to be burned up. And see, the one who is giving himself to all these riches, as, as they come and hear the gospel message, they realize it doesn't really matter. Caveat, I'm not saying you shouldn't work. I've already said that. You need to work. I'm not saying it's bad to, it's bad to accrue wealth for the, for the purpose of blessing your family and others. That's not a bad thing. I'm just talking about pursuing finances as everything. The almighty dollar. It's really humbling when you hear that all your pursuits in life have been for nothing. You know, Bill Gates back in the previous decade. I can't remember exactly when. I can say 2012. You know how much money he has. It's just too much to count, right? <laughs> it's just too much money to count. It just grows and grows each year. He's, he said, I wish I could give all this money away. He realized himself that this money isn't everything. He didn't want the money. He, he actually said it was a curse to him. Everyone coming, begging for money. Everyone just wanting his money. Not having any, doesn't know people. They can't know who he is. They, he wonders when someone gets into his life, what do you want from me? You want this, don't you? Here you go. You don't really want to know me. It's a curse, just like celebrities, right? You, you gain all the success and you think that you're on top of the world and yet you're so lonely, Robin Williams. Like this morning. It's really humbling to understand that your life's pursuits 
in this world that are outside of Christ amount to nothing. But that's what James wants you to see. He says, let the rich man boast in his humiliation. And the thought here is, is that if you were one who invested all your money into Boeing in 2018, right? <laughs> and then they just crashed and COVID happened. You're like, I lost all my money. James says, it's okay. It's okay. You're finding out what really matters. God is doing a great work in the midst of your trial. Your pursuit and understanding that it's not, this is not where it's all to be. This is not your heart's direction. That riches isn't your strength. But instead, it's found in humbling yourself. You know, isn't that what we long for when we're in a really high season? You know, we're all longing for that high season, but we all have a temperature gauge in our own souls, and we're like, maybe we're getting a little too high. Maybe we're getting a little too proud. Maybe we're thinking we're doing too well. We're like, uh-oh, I don't like this. <laughs> I can see my own soul go in the wrong direction. Lord, take it all away. And guess what he does? Takes it all away, right? There's a relationship between us doing so well and having all these riches and our faith. It's an inverse relationship. It's a trial. It doesn't mean if you're rich that you have a terrible spiritual life. No, it means that you're going to have the trial of riches. The money that we seek, that everyone seeks in the world, isn't going to end your trial. It's actually going to become the curse that takes away your faith. And so what James is saying is understand in that moment the humiliation of it all, that I'm stuck in a place where I have riches. Yes, there were rich converts in Jerusalem to Christianity. And James isn't saying give it all away, though you could read the New Testament saying that. More so, he is saying let him boast in what you've found, that life isn't a matter of gaining the world and losing your soul, but in humbling yourself at the foot of the cross and living like money isn't your great pursuit and seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness and then all these things that that the Gentiles are eagerly seeking, He'll add all those things to you. And so you don't find yourself being caught up with riches. Now that's glorious, isn't it? That's commendable. Don't you love to hear the stories about rich people who don't even know they're rich? <laughs> people who live like all of us, right? And say, I, I'm just one of you. I, I think it's been some time since I told you this, but um, I, I, I once met a rich man. I didn't even know it. <laughs> And the reason he was so rich was because he didn't live like riches matter. He had a simple car, simple house. He, for all means, you, you couldn't tell that he had all the riches. And again, I'm not, comm- I'm not saying it's bad to use wealth appropriately. I'm not saying that. Please don't hear me say that. I'm talking about the spiritual understanding that riches can eat out your own soul. And this man, this is the way he lived. He lived in such a way. Do you know what thrilled his heart? His wife, and, and he made a decision at the age of, I believe, 40 to give 1% more every year away. He was 70 when I met him. So that's, I think he was giving more than 20 at the time that I, that, uh, he stated that. So he was basically giving half his wealth away. And you think, that's great. That's wonderful. Why did he do that? Because he knew it wasn't about money. He knew there was something greater that his heart was pursuing. And you know what? He didn't talk about that. 
And that's what I love. I love when people aren't talking about what God's doing, but they're humbling, humbly doing the work that God has for them. And they are delighting their souls in God and saying, Lord, you want to bless me? Okay, I'm not going to be caught up with that curse. Yes, keep blessing that in. I'm going to keep doing my job, and I'm going to use what you've given me for your kingdom. I'm going to boast not in my riches, but how I've learned humility and how I want that victor's wreath one day. I want to endure through these trials. I want Christ to be king of my heart and never mammon. Boy, that's awesome. And I think that's where we are as America. I, mean, I don't want you to think about in this room and think like, this person's rich and I'm not. I'm richer than them. You know, we're richer than almost 90% of the world. I don't have the exact number, I'm sorry. But the fact that you have money in your wallet, you have food out here and in your refrigerators, that you have refrigerators and electricity, you are rich. Don't let it become something that destroys you. Affluence will destroy you, and it will eat up our America. Let us not give in to it. Let us Boast instead of our humiliation. How we found that this is not our all, but Christ Jesus is our all and all. Thou who was rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake, became as poor. He became poor for my poor soul. I want to live for him. Boast, boast. Let him boast. I'd encourage you to, to meditate upon this. Thought. These are just two examples. There's more that you could talk about. Let him boast. Let's pray together.